Okay guys, let's get started. Good afternoon everyone, I'm Mohamed Alser and today is lecture 5 about accelerating genome analysis. So basically the goal of this lecture is to show you how uh, computer architecture reshaping the race to um, analyze our genome quickly, efficiently and uh, cost uh, effectively. So Basically, uh, this lecture is not about how to analyze biological data using available tools, meaning that we are not related to wet lab using those biological uh, techniques and so on. So I will be focusing here on algorithmic techniques and um, hardware architectures where we can accelerate and get some benefits from the things that we learn in computer architecture course. So to get more information, I recommend those two box where you can uh, read more about genome analysis and some algorithms, some hardware design, some techniques that can uh, speed up the process to analyze our genomes. So the agenda for today, I will start talking about the importance of genome analysis and then what is genome analysis basically. And next, I will be going deeply more onto how we map the reads or basically how we analyze our genomes and how we make um, how we make read mapper faster using algorithm and hardware acceleration. And towards the end, I'll be talking about the challenges and the future opportunities for this area. So first of all, why genome analysis? Why we pick this topic to accelerate it? So the first thing we need to um, notice here is personalized medicine. So one in 17 people in the world develop a rare disease at some point in their life. So that's a number is 350 million worldwide. And this uh, in Switzerland only is 500,000 people. In EU is 30 million and 75% of those are children. So 80% of those rare disease is genetic disorder. And 30% of those children uh, never reach their fifth birthday. So in this recent paper showing that rapid whole genome sequencing, meaning that analyzing your genome, looking for some genetic variation that is associated with certain disease during the hospital, is going to decrease the infant morbidity and cost of hospitalization. So in their study, they changed the way the hospital that managed those cases, especially for critically ill infant, and they choose 13 13 uh, critically ill infant and they try to sequence their genome before they describe any medicine or the way they manage those cases. And they found that using this method they could reduce the cost for hospitalization by $800,000 to $2 million. So after, after this or aligning with this starting from uh, 2019, especially in UK, all seriously ill children will be offered whole genome sequencing as a part of their care in the hospital. So this is very important to save life. The second application or second important case is genome-wide association study or GWAS. So in this case, if we don't know which genetic variation causes which disease, as we do in the first application, here what we do, we have two groups of people. One of them we call it cases, the other is control. The cases are people that have that certain disease which we want to study. And the other group is the people without that disease. And then we try to sequence all those genomes. You can imagine if we have a thousand people here and thousand the other group, then we have two thousand. So we want to sequence all those two thousand genomes and then we compare it uh, base by base, character by character. And then we plot this Manhattan plot, which is the x-axis, the location in your genome. So you have this chromosome at each location. You record what was the genetic variation, how these people differ from that people. And then you signify the structure variation or the probability of having um, this uh, character rather than the other character. I'm going to show you next that the genome is consists of ACGTs. So if you have a C instead of T in certain place, that is going to associate going to be associated with a certain phenotype. It's not necessarily a disease. For example, eye color hair color and so on. It's not necessarily to be considered as disease but different phenotype. So
So here we can see that this is, for example, variant with a higher frequency in cases than control. So we can say something about it, but we cannot be sure that this location is associated with a certain disease. This is a toy example from Elizaris Ken lecture in CGSI 2018. You can see the blood pressure at the right side, and those are individuals. So each line is a, a small piece of the DNA where you can see, for example, it is associated with the high blood pressure with a certain SNP. SNP is single nucleotide polymorphism, or in short, it's just genetic variation, single character. So you can tell me, maybe some of you, which one is associated with the high blood pressure? Is it SNAP1 or SNAP2? One, right? Okay, smart people. So whenever you have high pressure disease, you may find this in your DNA, is replacing T with C, for example. So again, this is a toy example, just showing you um, the importance of uh, analyzing our genome. So is it only single character that gets replaced? No. So in those cases, four cases, you can see it's a large, uh, large variation in the genome. You can, for example, here, a deletion of around 600,000 characters. So if it is deleted, then it can be associated with autism or obesity. Or if it is duplicated, meaning that the same region appear twice next to each other or in a distance, then it can be associated with those diseases, for example, which is, we call it a mirror phenotype. So it's totally the opposite cases. So you can see the challenge is not just single variation or single character get changed. We are looking for even larger than that, 600,000 character. This is really huge. The third case, city scale microbiome bi uh, profiling. So if you are interested in, uh, for example, studying the type of viruses, bacteria in Zurich, or in tram stations, Zurich station, and so on. So you can do that using... Um, genome analysis and for example here in this case this is a paper published in 2015 it studied the old train station New York subway system where they study um, the everything related to the train station so it could be the train itself it could be the vending machine the counters and so on so they swap everything in those stations and they collect about 1500 samples then they sequence all of them and here's the result. So 50% of those species are unknown. They don't have any references. They never sequenced them before. The other 50, around 50% 50 are harmless bacteria. It's okay to have them. But most important thing is that they find Yersinia pestis. So for those who doesn't know this, this is a life-threatening uh, infection caused by bacteria. And in 14th century, it's killed more than one-third of the population of Europe. So imagine having such bacteria in New York subway, such crowded place. So this, of course, um, raised the alarm for the, 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 the people there, and it was hitting the news as well. However, when they investigated using the traditional method rather than using some algorithm or hardware techniques, so they discovered that this, this was a false alarm. It wasn't there. They didn't see any track of Yersinia pestis. And some people calling this a failure of bioinformatics. I would personally argue with that. This is not a failure of bioinformatics. This is rather than the accuracy of the tool they use in this study. So if they improve the tool, bioinformatics is still doing great. Okay, so now after finishing the application and showing the importance of doing this stuff, how you can benefit from computer architecture, from expert guys as you, doing building chips or building um, some kind of hardware accelerators, new algorithms in, in uh, having accelerating or such important problem, for example, genome analysis. So I'm sure all of you show, see this uh, picture from the previous lecture. So this is a human cell where you can see the DNA. DNA is double helix structure where you have A uh, binded to C and G binded to T. So, um, yeah. 
So here, basically, the DNA in all your cells is exactly the same. Whatever the, the cell is, liver, heart, hair, uh, eye, and so on. So what's the difference between those cells? Basically, is the gene that gets translated from the DNA into a phenotype. Either it will be turned on or off. So if I want, um, for example, heart cell, then I'm going to turn on the gene that's responsible to convert this cell into a heart cell, and so on. So the way we get trans uh, translating our uh, DNA is showing whether you will get this cell or that cell. But basically, if you analyze any cell, blood, whatever it is, so you're going to get the same, exactly the same genome or the same DNA content. So this is your DNA, which uh, stores uh, all your genotypes. You can consider it as a cookbook where you have all recipes there. So if you want to translate to something, you go to that DNA and read that gene and convert it to recipe, food, and so on. So if you, um, if you get transcripted, then it will be converted into RNA, which can be easily converted into a protein. So a protein is the thing that gets converted into a phenotype which appear to your face as a disease or just a phenotype, as I mentioned. So this will be the delicious apple pie here. So as I mentioned, we have adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. So those basically stabled if they are uh, binded together using a two hydrogen bond, and the guanine and cytosine using three hydrogen bonds. So this construct the, the, the double helix structure of the DNA where every T has a complement of A, G, C, G, C, A, T, and so on. So it's, it's good enough to read one of those strands because you already know that the other one will be just a complement. So if you, t if you stretch the DNA out of the cell, then it's two to three meter long. You can imagine how small the cell, how you can fit this much of amount of DNA there. So this is thanks to the supercoiled structure. It's, it's coiled, coiled, and supercoiled such that it can fit in this, in such tiny place, which is four to 100 microns. Why is this strange? Because your cell varies, like the size is not the same, but the DNA content is the same. So it depends on what cell type. Okay. So, how long the DNA? So, we have this virus. This phi virus is uh, 4,000, for example. Uh, this bacteria, E. coli bacteria, is 5 million character. And this bacteria can get infected by this virus. So, this virus can cause harm to this bacteria. Here we are, 3.2 billion character. This is stand for base pair. It's pair because we have A and T, C and G, and so on. Do we think we having the longest DNA among all species? Let's see. We have a red onion, 16 billion character. That is about 5x the amount of our DNA. We could be smarter, but not the longest DNA. And this Japanese flower, 150 billion character, it's about 50x longer than our DNA. Okay, this is how our chromosomes looks like under a microscope. And you have seen this from the previous lecture that Honor uh, gives. So this is a human chromosome number 12 for Henrietta Lacks. This hero had a cancer in the past and it was the only way um, to, it was basically the seed for all those genetic discoveries because we never had uh, cancer cells before that we can study. So the doctor that diagnoses her hide those cells, replicate them, distribute them to many labs in the world. And then this is how uh, all those genetic studies started based on hair cells. She wasn't aware about that. And then later on, this create many privacy issues and you can watch this movie to get more information about it. That's why they call it the immortal life. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, great. 
So what is genome analysis, basically? We learned that it's very important. We learn what is the DNA, but how we can analyze our DNA. So we agreed that the DNA content or the genetic information exists in all type of cells. So it's enough to pick, pick blood cell, for example, and analyze it. And this is our goal. We want to get the full content, 3.2 billion character exactly as they are, and then we start reading them and earn for some information, for example, genetic variation. And again, it could be single character or a huge portion of the DNA. Unfortunately, we don't have such machine, technique, method, or anything, any black box that can provide you the entire content at one shot. So this initiated the, the, the global effort, uh, collaboration between US, UK, Japan, and many other countries for 13 years. They said, okay, we want to have the human reference genome that we can rely on and everyone want to sequence his genome just compare it to that reference and said something about it but it cost three billion dollars so normally they said each character cost them one dollar to read it so you can imagine 13 years just to sequence a single individual or multiple individual which is a huge amount of time so imagine some those elephants for example if you want to sequence their DNA and it took, took you like 13 years so it's, it's really um, not that practical to do it in the conventional ways but it was very helpful to have this reference genome in these days, we have those technology. We call them high throughput sequencing, which give you each line is a totally independent output of the machine. It's very short segment of your DNA. It could be short or relatively long, but still cannot be the full or the, the entire genome sequence. And these days, the technology provides you this much of characters in 44 hours and cost you less than $1,000 could be in $200, $500, depends on the technology and the company that um, analyzing your genome. However, because the technology provide you portions of your sequence, is not the entire thing, then this is converting to totally different problem. So we need to link those pieces together to build the entire sequence before analyzing it. That's why this is the sequencing machine. We have those reads. We call this step read mapping. Read mapping meaning that building your a genome or any donor genome could be virus, bacteria, back to the full sequence of the DNA. We have different types of those machines. It could be connected to your iPhone. It could be hand size, USB stick, and room size, and so forth. So all of them differ like in the throughput, the cost, and the, 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 the read length, or this uh, small portion of the DNA. Now, how those machines works. So you can think about it as you have a glass surface and you stick the, the part of your DNA to that glass surface and then based on this theory that A always connected to T, G to C so what we do basically we, ha we add the molecules ourselves to the uh, glass surface so if we add a T and there was A then there will be a chemical reaction, right? We have an optical sensor to observe that chemical reaction so, okay, we have that chemical reaction, then the sequencer will produce A. We keep repeating the same thing, so we add four molecules for each uh, character. Then we wash the surface, we repeat the steps. Why we add four molecules? Because we don't know basically what, what's the character at this location. It could be C. So we wait until we add the G, then we observe the chemical reaction. And we do this for many times in parallel for many of the molecules or many of the DNA segments in our sample. That's why we call it high throughput sequencing. So we produce much of those in parallel. However, those segments lack information about their order, which ones come first, and they have no information about which part of the genome they are originated from. So it could be from chromosome 1, 2, 3, and so on. So this would be the problem. You have all the smashed 
uh, tiny pieces and you want to construct them back. So this slide prepared by Gian Fortino. Okay, so the easiest way is to have this reference picture as you, so, as you are solving puzzle, for example, and based on the picture you start constructing the larger pieces, then the smaller and so forth. But if you don't have that reference picture, for example, a virus that you didn't study before, the only way you have is to link them together based on the overlapping uh, portions. So this is a read, this is another read. So to connect this to that with an edge, this should match the first character here. Then you build what we call a De Bruyne graph, the entire graph, and then you find one path uh, through this graph and say, okay, this is the longest I could have, this can be the genome itself, for example. However, this is very complex, you have a lot of loops, you need to resolve them first, which path should I consider, this or the other one, and so on. There are, this is a totally different research area, and what we are focusing now on the reference-based method, when you have a reference and you want to sequence or analyze your DNA. So those machines produce two types. So one, one of the machines, we call it second generation sequencing machine, produce the smaller pieces. And the third generation sequencing machine produce the larger pieces. So which one is better? Do you want to have small pieces that is exactly as you are solving puzzle. Do you want to go to the market and buy the one with smaller pieces? It could be 1,000, 2,000 pieces, or the one with the larger pieces, 16 pieces, 10 pieces. However, it's not that simple. So everything comes at cost. The smaller pieces are very accurate, but they are short. The longer pieces are very long, but inaccurate. So you can have about 15% error. So using only long reads, then you are not sure whether that genetic variation comes from a disease or phenotype or just simply sequencing error, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> sorry, how to analyze our genome? We got this uh, genetic sample, we sequence it, we produce all those reads, then we bring the reference genome if we have it, and then we try to stick each short piece to that reference based on the similarity. So we will bring all those smaller pieces, link them together, and then we have our entire genome. And remember, we need to allow for some minor differences. Why is that? Because this is the goal behind analyzing our genome, to know where are the genetic variations, right? So we need to allow for that. So it, they can be different, the read and the reference, where we stick them together. They are not necessarily exact match, but still this is the right position where we can stick it. This is very important to remember. We're going to explain how. So in this scenario, for example, if you are not studying a single genome, which we call it genomics, this one we call it metagenomics, where you study a city scale, where you pick a sample, you swap it from train station, for example. You, so you don't expect to have a single DNA. You have viruses, bacteria, everything in a single sample. So you sequence everything using the sequencer, and you have a reference database. So it could be 60,000 genomes, for example, or 6,000, 10,000, depends on what species you are looking for. If you are looking for bacteria, so you bring the database of bacteria that you have studied before. And then you try to stick all the reads to all the references you have. And then you build the, the reference sequence, or your sequence. But again, because you are sequencing everything, all the DNA, so you don't expect to have the entire sequence completely. Each piece, because it's short, should be shared among different references. So you can think about it as unique color M&Ms and mixed color. So this is genomics, this is metagenomics, and both of them same method, but the challenge is that we have many references. So what are the challenges in read mapping? So again, all of us agree now what's read mapping, where you map all those short pieces to the reference and you want to build the reference back. So we need to find many mapping location of each read. So each read can exactly match or with some differences to many locations. We need to find all of them. We don't want to discard any of them at this uh, position. 
and we want to tolerate small variation as well as sequencing error. Both short and long reads have sequencing error. The short one is accurate, which means 99.9%, .9%, but still there are sequencing errors. And we need to map this, or we need to complete this process very fast because it can be uh, life critical, as we um, saw in the, um, the first few slides. Okay, so how we do that? A brute force algorithm is to pick the read, do you have the reference, go scan it linearly. Check every single location the reference. Do I have match? Do I have match? Do I have match? Until I get a perfect match or within a certain threshold. But this is very expensive. Why is that? OKMN. K is number of reads, how many times you are repeating this. M is the read length and N is the reference length. Okay, what's the best way to do it then? How many of you know about this? I'm not sure if you have it. So, myself, I had it like 15 years ago. I'm not that old. But, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if people are still using this. This is a phone book where you can search for any friend, colleague, uh, phone number. So, how you search this book normally? A binary search, like you see where you are, and then you kind of half every time. This is one of the ways where you can search anything very fast, efficiently. Excellent. Logan, you can go to the middle, then search right or left and see. But if you have an index or a preface in this book, then you can go to section A, for example, where it contains all names starting with A. Then you go to that specific section and you start looking for the full name character by character because it's basically alphabetical ordered, uh, those names. So we are going to do exactly the same way to analyze our genome or to map those reads. So first thing, we go to the book index a check portion of the name, normally this is the first character, right? Only the first character, so if it is A, we go to section A. And next step, we retrieve the page number of that section where it starts and look for the full name. Then we start from the second character, third character, until we get full match for the entire name, right? So let's see how we can repeat exactly the same steps for read mapping. So we are going to build index data structure. So the easiest, simplest, most efficient way is to do hash table. There are many other ways, building trees, for example, and so forth. But let's pick hash table, for example. So this is our reference genome. We want to build index or preface for the reference genome. So we have the hash table. We get the first piece. Then we record it here, and then we record all the occurrences of that location in the reference. So the first, for example, 12 character of the reference genome, we record it. Then we keep searching the entire reference where this kmer or seed happened in the reference genome. So it's starting at position 12, so this seed um, starting at 12, but the entire seed is from 12 to uh, 24, for example, and so on. I'm sure you, all of you know how to build hash table. So some people could say, like, this is a brute force algorithm, right? So we are searching linearly the entire algorithm for every seed. So we pick the seed and we keep searching for all the location we record in the hash table. But this is, fortunately, we are recording it once, forever. So we build the hash table, we store it somewhere, and CPI database or NIH and so forth. And then, whenever we want to analyze a human body genome, we just pick that hash table, which is a pre-built, pre-processed, and use it to query the seeds. Now, this always provides you all one when you, whenever you want to query the hash table. So, now, how to use the hash table? How to use the index of the yellow pages box? So we have the read, which is coming from the sequencer machine. We want to chop it, exactly as we do for the reference genome. If we chop 12 character base seeds, then we will do the same thing here. So we produce three seeds out of the read. Then we pick the first seed, Let's, let it be the red one. We send it to the hash table, does it exist? The hash table will reply back with all the location, if it exists. If not, then it's not there. Then I got the location for the red guy, the blue, and the green. 
Then now, the next step, after I got the, the page of the section that starts with alphabet A, as I do in the yellow pages, I'm going to do the, exactly the same thing here, where basically I will go to this section, to this, to that reference genome, and extract the same length of the read. What does that mean? I'm going to location 12 in the reference genome. If the read length is 36 in this example, then I'm going to start from location 12 to the next 36 character. I'll pick the read back, stick it to this location, and start a process that I call it verification or read alignment. Then we start exactly as I'm doing in the uh, form book. In the phone book, once I figure out where are the, where's the section, then I go check the full name. And here, once I figure out the potential location, I'm going to check the full length of the read. And go character by character, check. This is my full name, this is my full name, no, continue, and so on. So this is exact match, then probably this is the location. I move on to the next location and so forth. So at this location, I have a lot of mismatches or differences, and it's up to you to choose it or not based on, on a threshold. Okay, I think it's, this is clear, right? Okay. Now, what is uh, read alignment or verification step that we show between the sequence and the reference uh, segment? So basically, how many of you know um, Hamming distance? Okay, great. Edit distance. Great. Levenstein distance. Okay, so you could use any metric you want. It's up to you. You can pick Hamming distance, but Hamming distance, unfortunately, cannot provide you insertion and deletion. It only provides you um, the substitutions. So whether it's match or mismatch, that's it. But normally you use edit distance, which provides you the ability to delete a character or um, replace it. So, for example, if I ask you what are the differences between organization and operation, you could have it in different setup. So you can delete characters, you can remove character, you can have some exact match, and the answer is seven operations, where I'm adding those, deleting this, and deleting those. Then I could have exact match between organization and operation. Same thing for organization and translation, the edit distance is four. I could do it in different many configuration, but this one provide me the list the list number of operation, edit operation. Again, all of us agree now that though there are some deletion or some differences, but we still call this as exact match. Why is that? Because my threshold, for example, is 10. If it is below the threshold, then I'm calling it um, a good mapping, correct mapping, or simply exact match. So, Okay, so the, the thing I explained just now, we call it hash-based read mapper. Hash-based read mapper, because I'm using hash table as index data structure for the mapping. So I could use uh, Boris Wheeler's transformation, for example, then I call it BWT something. So what are the advantages of using hash table in such read mapping process? It's guaranteed to find all mapping. Why is that? Because I'm going over all the seeds in the hash table and location by location, the location list, and verifying them one by one. So it's kind of impossible to miss any of those. The other thing that I can tolerate up to E errors or structure variation or genetic variations per read because I'm using edit distance. If you're using Hamming distance, then you can tolerate only mismatches. Okay, going back to the sequencing machine, so um, one of the best, I wouldn't say the best, one of the best machine can produce 300 million characters per minute. However, those read mappers, the hash-based read mapper, again, one of the best, or state-of-the-art, can process only 2 million characters per minute. So we can see there's a performance bottleneck here and the read mapper is 150x slower than the sequencer. This is fair comparison, single threaded and uh, single sequencer machine and so on. So the comparison is based on this tool and this machine. Okay, what makes read mapper slow? It doesn't make sense that we have all these advances 
and, and the sequencing machine, but when it comes to the analysis part, it's very slow. So even if we buy this uh, cost-effective sequencer, but we still cannot analyze our DNA in the critical time point, then we didn't gain anything, right? So it's important to profile the performance of this read mapper and figure out what was the bottleneck, what is causing this read mapper to be slow. And for that, we did a study and showing that three key observations. So the first one, we figure out that 90% of the execution time of a typical read mapper spent only in verification, not in the hash table, not in seed verification. It's only in read alignment, which is edit distance algorithm where we verify the sequence or the read with the reference segment. So 90% is spent there, which is very time consuming. Key observation two. So whenever I go to the seed, a seed hat in the hash table, then I go to the location list and start verifying one by one. So 98% of those locations are incorrect, meaning that the differences between the sequence and the reference at that location exceeding your threshold. So I'm wasting my time just verifying those location, and if I have a certain way to know that this is exceeding your threshold, then you don't verify it using expensive algorithm. Third observation, that I'm using always dynamic programming algorithm to perform edit distance calculation, which requires quadratic time. Okay, if dynamic programming algorithm is bad, why am I using it? The answer is, half of this sentence is not bad, which is dynamic programming. It's meant to be good, right? Because saving the computation where you store it somewhere and then reusing it, right? So for example, in this uh, toy example, I have Netherlands and Switzerland. So I, I want to compare them character by character. So I, would, I need to enumerate all kind of possibilities of Switzerland and then compare it with Netherlands or vice versa. I enumerate all type of um, possibilities of Netherlands and convert and compare it with uh, Switzerland. So here you can notice that I'm comparing S, then SW, then SWI, and so on. So if I already computed to S, why I need to repeat the same thing when I compare SW and SWI, and so on. So this is inefficient. So to do that efficient way, I need to use dynamic programming, where I store the result in some of the cells, then I reuse it whenever I need it. However, to maintain some calculation for a table, I need two nested for loop, right? So one uh, iterating over the rows, the other iterating over the columns, for example. And this is how I get the quadratic time, and this is the uh, difficult part, or the bad part about the dynamic programming algorithm. The second thing, because I'm storing the results, so I need to access them in a certain way. I cannot access them randomly. For example, if I'm storing the value here, then whenever I want to access it, I can access it only from here, going to up or left or into a diagonal way. So that um, restricts me to parallelize such algorithm. I cannot do parallel processing, for example, because I need to access them either in rows or columns, or anti-diagonal shape. And the third thing, that you need to wait until this cell to infer that the number of differences is five. So you cannot go some midway and say, okay, let's wait. Uh, am I exceeding the threshold? If I'm exceeding, just stop here and terminate the algorithm. I cannot do that. I have to wait all the way until I finish all calculation and go to the last cell to check the value of that cell to tell me how many differences I have. Okay, so what is our goal here? Is to significantly reduce the time spent in calculating the optimal alignment because as we observe that it's 90% of the time spent in this step. So we want to do something about this step based on the observation that we have. And definitely we want this giving the limited computation of resources, for example hospitals, they don't have a cloud cluster and so on, most of them I would say, and personal usage or small uh, genetic centers. Of course we want something fast, cheap, accurate and portable. So how many of you watch this movie? Very old one. Okay, great. How many of you watch the recent one? 
Tomorrowland. Okay, if you notice that in both of them, they have this Apple Watch or whatever smart watch where you put your finger, it has a micro needle, can access your blood, then analyze it in a few seconds. It could be less than one second. And then it will verify your identity based on your DNA and can tell you whether you are this person or that person. This is something great to have. And until now, unfortunately, we don't have it. So if we could build something that small, that efficient, that accurate, then it will be great to have it. It will, I believe, revolutionize everything. Okay, so this is going to shape the, the, the way we think a little bit. So this is um, a news from last year where Illumina, Illumina is a company that produced these sequencing machines, the short ones, short reads, um, acquired Edico Genome, which is a company that used FPGA board to accelerate some of the algorithm used to analyze our genome. So you can think if a company has a sequencer, then they have the ability to build FPGA chips to accelerate some certain of analysis. Then we have all of them together combined in one machine. You don't have to wait 44 hours, as I mentioned in the previous slide, to get the entire pieces of your DNA. Then you start analyzing them. You could, you could overlap the time where you generate those sequencing and where you can start analyzing them right away the moment you get the first read. So this is, I don't think we are going to have it very soon, but this can say something about the future. The same company, last year as well, they start negotiating about a deal to buy another company that produced the sequencing machines, but that produces um, the long reads. So Illumina, short reads, Backbio, another company producing the very long reads. So imagine the, how powerful it will be to have all of those in one solution. Of course, the cost here is going to be another concern. So it's going to be very expensive per sample. Okay, now let's refresh our mind about read mapping. So I have the read, I extract the seed, I query the seed in the hash table, I got those location, I go to back to the reference genome, I extract all the sequences from the reference genome at certain location, and I start aligning using those dynamic programming algorithm per location, verifying one by one, one by one, I get single match, most of the others are mismatch. Yes? I have a question about the hash table. Mm -hmm. There is a mistake in the seed. Mm -hmm. um, how do you then find the proper place to do sequence alignment? Excellent. Excellent question. So I'm looking for genetic variation, right? So if I have exact match from hash table, then where's the um, genetic variation? Okay, that's a very good question. The answer is normally here what we store is very short string. It's like 12 or 15 or 16, right? Around that. So based on this, this is not the entire read. So this is part of it. So we have 15 here, another first 15 maybe in the, in the middle of the read. Then the, in between, is you are free to have whatever you want. So you could have many genetic variations, many things, right? And if you don't have at all, your threshold is high to tolerate more uh, differences, then this is good enough to guarantee that you will observe those genetic variations. But what do you do if there is a miss in those 12 or 15 uh, characters? You simply won't get them. You'll get something else that exactly match, right? But do you then go through the entire uh, genome uh, for that case, those rare cases? Yeah, this will be good enough to cover the entire thing. So, for example, if you have this, uh, the genome, this is one of the location. You get the seed here, 12 character. This is exact match because uh, in hash table I cannot have something else. I cannot search for an exact match. And the rest of it, normally they read, if it is short, it's about 300 character. If it is long, then 1,000 all the way to 2 million for the recent technology. So you have the rest of the read covered by any variation you like, right? If this one has a, mis a mismatch, as you mentioned, then you will not get this location. You may get this location, right? where you have the seed here and you start verifying from here or the reverse order. So we have that property is to go forward or backward, same thing. 
So anyway, you will cover this location. Okay, so you don't discard it, you just still try and find it. Just take that again depends on you. So all of those are parameters, you can set it up before using the tool. Okay, For example... There's 12 characters, you'll probably have like a 1% chance of having a miss there, because the human genome is 99.9% the same. The same. Mm -hmm. So if you 1% of the time go through the entire genome, then wouldn't that be significant? It's hard to calculate it because normally we use heuristics. I'm going to show you how we reduce this workload again. We will use heuristics even to reduce this location. So it's hard always to guarantee that you will get this location. But what we do to guarantee that, normally in the sequencer machine we have something we call it coverage. Coverage mean means that at this location, how many times do you want me to read the exact uh, location? If you specify it as 30x, then I'm going to read this character 30 times. Then you will have many reads that uh, map to the same location and overlapped. Right? So then, after read mapping, the, you are going to resolve those overlaps by removing all of them and keep one based on majority voting, for example. So if you miss this read, which starts from here, you are going to get this read anyway, by chance, by luck, or by theory, right? Or you will get this read, this read, this read, and so on. So normally they use this much of coverage. You could use 100x of coverage if it is really critical to do so, and so on. So anyway, you will guarantee to have that working. Yeah? Is the reference genome like, probabilistic somehow? Does it say that there's like a 75% chance this character is in A? Or? So that's a very good question, first of all. Um, human being um, differs from each other like 99.01% uh, and 99.9% .9 are similar, right? However, our genome is not only 3.2 billion character. So some of the studies showing that in Africa, for example, they have longer genomes. They have more portion duplicated. So that's create another concern whether this reference genome that we all using it starting from more than 20 years ago that we that cost us 3.2 billion dollar whether worth it to always compare with that reference what if I'm studying someone in Africa or in UK or in Switzerland and so on so that's why all the governments start uh, those projects to do personalized medicine for the population that they have UK have their own sequences for the population of UK, US, Switzerland, they started this recently, um, Swiss Genomics or the Health 2030 in Switzerland. The, the goal is to sequence as many as they can from the population of Switzerland. In this case, they can have a clean reference that they can compare those population to that reference that, rather than considering just single reference for the entire world. Does that answer your question? So the probability of having that character or this, this again depends on the population. That's why we have GWAS study and TWAS and so on. In GWAS we consider a population. Rather than single person to single person, we consider thousand person to thousand person who have th that disease and so on. Okay. Hope this is clear. This is just to refresh our mind about uh, hash-based read mappers. So, again, why this read mapping process is slow? We have three key observations. Now we are going to solve those, um, 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 the slowness of the read mapper based on the observation that we have. So the first step you could do is seed filtering. When you seed the hash, when you query the hash table. So, when you query that hash table, you get as many seeds as you have in the seed location. We want to reduce that workload. So, we will use heuristics, and that only supports exact matches. 
The other direction, you could do pre-alignment filtering. As I mentioned, using dynamic programming all the, all, all the time is very expensive. If we have a smart way to know that whether this sequence is exceeding the threshold or not, before using dynamic programming, it will be great to have it. The third direction is read alignment acceleration. So the dynamic programming algorithm itself, it's hard to accelerate it. As I mentioned, there is data dependencies between the rows, columns, or anti-diagonals. So what you could do, process as many as you can in parallel. So pick 1,000 sequences, have replication of a module in Verilog that process one sequence, have 1,000 of those replications, and then process all of them in parallel. This is how you accelerate it, right? So this is one way of doing that. But normally, because you are limited to the resources, you are going to simplify the, the scoring function. Scoring function is the number you register in each cell in the Dynam programming table. So you are limited to a certain size, right? You need to define the size of that cells. It could be 8 bits, 16 bits, 32 bits. So there is no unique way to pick that number. This is one of the drawbacks. Yes. So far, those are the three main direction to accelerate read mapping process. And I'm going to start the next one. Should we take a break now? Yes? How many of you need a break? Could you explain the drawback once more? Would it just OK, sure. So I'm going to explain the slide once, once more, then we take a break. Okay. You mean this slide, right? Yeah, just the drawback you were talking about. Okay, so um, in the last part, we have the dynamic programming table, right? So in each cell, you calculate something based on the previous cells, then you store it, then you move next, then you reuse that cell to calculate something else, right? So the result will be accumulated over the cells. So that's why the size of that uh, cell, you need to be sure that can fit the maximum value you could have while you are calculating. So when you design something in hardware or in Verilog, you need to specify the length of that register, for example. 8 bits, 16 bits, 32, right? So which one to pick? 16 bit, 13, 64? There's no guarantee that you cannot exceed that number, especially for very long reads, like 1,000, 2 million. So imagine you have two million cells, and over the cells you are accumulating the results. So this is very challenging to have. This is one of the challenges. And normally they are simplifying the scoring function, which affect the result. So I'm going to um, tell you about smart ways how you can accelerate read alignment without even touching the algorithm, without touching those uh, variable size and so on, the read length, and all those stuff. Okay, let's have 10 minutes break, come back. Okay, let's start. So before the break, we have those three main directions where we can accelerate read mapper. So we start from seed filtering, then pre-alignment filtering, and all the way to read alignment acceleration. So now let's start with seed filtering. So the, the, the idea here is very simple, where we have the read, we extract the seed, we go to the hash table, we query that seed, we extract it from this, uh, the read, then we get a bunch of locations. And then here we do some heuristics to reduce the location list before verifying it. So we start to reduce the number, then we send only a few of them to the uh, computationally expansive um, verifier or read aligner. And then we have just a few of them sent to the dynamic programming algorithm, and then we get the, the results. So let's see um, one of the ways that we can reduce this uh, seed locations. So the first one we call it adjacency filter, where we are only interested in adjacent k-mers. So one of you mentioned that if we have those location or certain genetic variation in some of the, the seeds, so we are not going to have that seed among the seed location from the hash table, right? Because it basically differs from the sequence we have here. So that's okay as long as we have as many seeds as we can. So if we have, if we cover this area by, I'm not sure if you can see it, 
Yeah, anyway, I'm going to show it later. So if you cover a certain position with 10 uh, seeds and one of them mismatch, so we, I couldn't get it in the location, I will get the other nine locations. So if they are adjacent next to each other, then this is potentially a good uh, mapping or a good match. So basically, if you want to tolerate E errors, you could uh, expect to not have at most E of those seeds um, do not appear in that location. So I have example, I'm, I'm going to show it in the next um, slide maybe. So the second observation, whenever I query a seed in the hash table, I can get maybe a billion location, million location, thousand, I have no guarantee about it because the, basically 50% of the human genome is repeated. So 50% repetition in the human genome. So I, I cannot expect that a single seed appears uh, um, twice, few times, 10 times. So normally the, the location list is uh, huge. So some of those are cheap, meaning that I can use the dynamic programming algorithm a few times, if it appears a few times in the genome. And the other times, it's really expensive to verify at each certain locations. So what this work proposed is, first of all, applying adjacency filter means exactly the same steps, but whenever you get the seed location, because this is a seed filter, again, don't forget that, so we go to the seed location. If the first seed appears at location 12, then I should expect the next seed to appear at the adjacent location, which is 24. Why 24? Because the seed is 12 character long, and starting at 12, then it should end at uh, 23, then the next seed should start at 24. So, I, I go to the next seed location, because I extracted from there at first location, then the next one should be adjacent to it, the next 12 character, and the next, or the third seed should appear after that. So I have the first seed appearing at 12, then 24, then 36, then they are adjacent, then this is probably a good mapping. Then if this condition met, then I'm going to apply the dynamic programming algorithm. Now some of you could say, okay, what if I miss one of the location due to um, genetic variation, for example? If I didn't get this seed, what will happen? It's okay as long as I have my threshold covering those missing seeds. Meaning that if my edit distance threshold is 1, so I'm allowed to miss one seed. If my edit distance threshold is 2, so I can tolerate missing two seeds to not be adjacent to the one I have. So how I do that basically when I implement it, I go to the lo all location list, I sort all of them in ascending order, then I start checking one by one. So if at location one, it already exists in the read, then I go to the next seed. If it is at location, for example, one plus the seed length, then and, and exist in the read, then this is potentially a good fit. I could again drop some of the seeds due to genetic variations and proceed. This is obviously save a lot of computation by ignoring most of the seeds that not appearing in adjacent places in the reference. So this is repeating the same steps. So if the first one starting at 500, 57, then the next one should be plus 12 and so on. So if it doesn't appear, then I discard the alignment. No need to do alignment here because my edit descent threshold is zero. Okay, so this is the next seed filter, which is a cheap Kamer selection. And the, the, the idea here, if some of the seed appears more than a threshold, then ignore them. Whenever I query a seed in the hash table and it appears more than 2 million uh, times and my threshold, for example, 500, then ignore that seed. So, for example, I have some seeds from the, the, this read sequence, then this is what I get. Those are the location list um, returned back by the hash table. So my threshold is 500, so which one to ignore, which one to accept? So here are the location, and this is the number of location, each location list. So apparently I go over them one by one, and if this is less than threshold, keep it. Less than or equal the threshold, keep it. 
more than the threshold, just ignore it. So I'm going to ignore all those because heuristically they are called expansive seeds because they have many locations and they need to verify one by one. So before applying this heuristic, I have like 3,000 locations to be verified and after that I have only 8 locations to be verified. Now, how, how that works, if I'm ignoring some certain location in the reference genome, how am I going to get a correct result? Again, this is heuristics. There is no guarantee to provide you an optimal result, but for sure it will provide you some good results over time. So basically, allowing some of those seeds to not be present in the sequence, this will allow you to have some genetic variations. So even if you ignore some of the seeds, but some of them are already there, plus you are allowing to not have them adjacent based on the threshold, then you will cover some of those locations at the end. And you are not going to miss some of the correct mappings. So this is one of the um, um, methods that that is implemented with uh, a read mapper called Mr. Fast. This method called Fast Hash because it's related to the way we uh, reduce the workload in the hash table. And this is the way they implement it, some technical details. And this is the most interesting part is that they, are, um, they, they gain 19x of speed up just with the help of those two uh, seed filters. And this is the amount of um, correct location or the amount of the bad location, incorrect location that they get, um, that they reduce it. So this is the number of correct, this is the ground truth results. And this is um, the pre before applying the filter, and this is after applying the filter. So they are getting very close to the optimal result, reducing all the false mapping locations um, um, by 99%. Again, they are not, they are not uh, exceeding the number, they are not reducing the number of ground truth results or the number of correct locations they should get. Now this is the fast hash conclusion. So the problem was that the hash based read mappers are very slow because they are um, returning back all the results from the hash table and we need to verify them one by one. So how they solve it, they have two filters. The first one, um, they observe that all those seed location, if they are not adjacent, then it's unnecessarily to perform uh, some um, expansive algorithms such as the dynamic programming or the read alignment. And this was the key idea to reject invalid mapping early before applying this expensive algorithm and uh, verifying only the cheap seeds. So they provide the 19x of speed up over state of the art mapper. And this is the paper, they have the source um, code published already available online so you can have it, you can play with it, you can try some other configuration maybe some other thresholds and see what um, speed up you can get or if you can improve the accuracy of such filters. Okay now we finished the first direction we, where we reduced the location coming from the hash table. Now the second direction to accelerate read mapper which is a pre-alignment filtering. Pre-alignment meaning that just a step before applying the um, read alignment algorithm. Okay so now we agree that alignment is computationally expensive and we need to reduce the time spent on the alignment and this can be done in two ways. So either you optimize the algorithm for, for alignment or you reduce the workload that is coming as input to the uh, read align. So optimizing the algorithm for alignment, um, it's kind of hard because those algorithms are 100% accurate and it's been there since 30 years or more. Uh, all those at a distance, Hamming distance and so forth. Smith, Waterman, Needleman, Wunsch, and all those kind of dynamic programming, string matching algorithm. So it's kind to optimize it more unless you do some uh, parallel processing, meaning that not parallelizing the computation itself within a single sequence, but processing many sequences at the same time. So 
Um, we're going now to explain the other method where you have a pre-alignment filter and the goal is basically to improve the filtering step. So you already filter some of the seed, now let's do some filtering on the sequence level. So this is the proposal. We have the hash table returning some seed location, we apply some pre-alignment filtering and then we have the read alignment. But be careful. This pre-alignment filtering should filter out most of incorrect mapping, meaning that preserving all the correct ones, and should do it very fast. Why we need to be a quick in um, processing those or filtering those locations? Because anyway, we have a read alignment process that's already expensive. If the pre-alignment filter is also expensive, then we are going to increase the execution time and no benefits gained. So the first method here called shifted hamming distance. So it's um, apparently taking some ideas from hamming distance, but um, solving the limitation of hamming distance that cannot um, tolerate uh, deletions or insertions. So this is enabling or empowering uh, hamming distance to have the ability to handle all kind of edits, substitutions, uh, mismatch, deletion, insertion, and so on. So the key idea if, or the key observation, if two strings or two sequences differ by more, by E edits, E edits, edits mean here deletion, insertion, substitution again, then every character, every character can be aligned in at most two E shift. Now I'm going to explain in toy example why two E shift. E here, the edit descent threshold, and 2E shift mean the shift amount um, for that character to be aligned. The key idea is computing shifted hamming distance and then use AND operation between all those masks. So I'm going to compute the shifted hamming distance. In hamming distance I basically do XOR, but here I'm going to do a shift operation with a certain amount, then XOR, then do AND operation to the result of the uh, XOR result. All of this apparently can be processed using pat uh, bit parallel processing, using SIMD instruction for example. And the key result here is providing 3x faster than uh, CCAN, and best implementation of Gene Meyer's bit vector algorithm, and providing only 7% false positive, meaning that the output of this filter, 7% of this output is wrong. I shouldn't um, generate it as output, but it was there. This is good. As long as I don't have um, false negative, this is fine. False negative means a correct mapping, less than the threshold, and I'm ignoring it, or I'm deleting it, and I'm discarding it. So, as long as I have more workload, it's fine, rather than having less workload. But, again, I need to do that in very fast speed. Okay, this is the two toy example. I have Istanbul and Istanbul. If you compare it in having distance fashion, meaning that character by character, do XOR operation, this is what you'll get, perfect match. So I have eight matches, zero mismatches. Okay, now let's do some edit operation. Do you like deletion, addition, and so on? So let's do deletion. Let's delete um, character A. Now the other sequence will be this way. So now the problem becomes the comparison between those two sequences. If I do hamming distance again, what I will get is five mismatches though I just perform single uh, deletion. So how to fix that? So it says, observation, if I delete a character, then all the trailing character will be shifted to the left. So to fix that, let's shift them to the right. This is how um, they call it shifted hamming distance. So in this way, okay, let's compare again now but without using hamming distance, let's use the new version, shifted hamming distance. So I'm going to copy the same sequence twice, and one of them will be shifted by one step to the right because there was one deletion. So I'm going to shift it by one step to the right. Why to the right, not to the left? <coughs> Any answer? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. 
Excellent. So because I delete one character, all the trailing will be shifted to left. I'm going to do the opposite, shift it to the right. So if I have insertion, I'm going to shift it to the left. Okay. Now I will do Hamming distance, but after the shift operation. So let's do XOR. I'm doing XOR for the first sequence. I get three matches. I'm doing XOR with the second sequence. I'm getting four matches. But how to calculate the final result? Okay, let's, this is the result of the XOR operation. So I have all those zero, zero mean a perfect match, ones mean mismatch. So, yeah, I think we have four zeros here and three one here. Yeah. Yeah, I need to correct that. Okay, so consider we have matches here. Let's correct it now. So we have now um, a correct calculation. Yeah, so we have the result of the XOR operation. Now what we do is AND operation between the two vectors. So doing the AND, we got this result. And now counting the number of ones, ones again represent the mi um, mismatches, zero represent the matches. This will give you the correct result, which is seven matches, one mismatch. Now, okay, um, I, I already did the deletion myself, so I know in advance it was a single one. What if I have combination of addition, deletion, substitution together in the same sequence? So to do that, I'm going to rely on the edit distance threshold. If the user uh, asks me to do within an edit distance threshold of two, then I'm going to have different version of this mask which is the second sequence. So rather than having one version or one copy of the sequence, I'm going to have E much of those sequences shifted to the right by different steps, and another E version of that sequence shifted to the left. In this way, I'm covering all kinds of operation. If this deletion is going to appear in the sequence that I shifted to the left, if this um, deletion and so on, all of them I am covering all kinds of possibilities of having those edit operation. And this is what we call shifted Hamming distance. Again, the source code is available online. You can have it. It's implemented in SIMD instructions. But if you are familiar with it, go ahead, please, and try to do something with it. OK, can we speed up the operation, the computation there? Gaining just 3x of speed up, is it enough? No, of course, because we are having a huge amount of data to be processed coming from the sequencer, and still the bottleneck is 150x slower than the sequencer machine. So since SHD is purely relying on bit-wise um, bit, uh, operations, so we can accelerate it using FPGA, for example. It sounds like a perfect fit for that. So what we do here, again, another example, how we convert the, the dynamic programming algorithm into those shifted Hamming masks. So here, again, um, for each cell, if you want to calculate it, we check this result, this and that, and then we compute that one. But in here, what we call a neighbor neighborhood map, what we do is just character to character comparison. So you compare A to C, mismatch one, A to T, mismatch one, A to A, match, then zero keep doing this until the end. Now what's the difference between this and that? This is totally independent of each other. No data dependencies here. Each one totally independent of any other character in the same row or in the same column. So you can process everything at parallel in one shot. Okay, now if you think about it in a different way, if you try to lay them down, rather than they are in diagonal shape, lay them horizontally, what you figure out? For example, this one, the yellow, the yellow vector, is pairwise comparison, right? The first character with the first, second with the second. The entire yellow thing is same as it is. But if you go a little bit to the lighter blue vector, what do you observe? 
For example, the C, which is the second character from the vertical sequence, is compared to the first character of the horizontal sequence. Meaning that I'm starting from the second with the first, then the third with the second, and so on. This is something like I'm shifting the vertical sequence to the right by one step. Then I do the comparison. No, sorry, to the left. So I'm shifting the sequence to the left so that the second character of this sequence coming to the first, opposite to the first. So in the, the dark blue ones, I'm shifting it to the left by two steps, such that I'm comparing the third character of this uh, sequence, which is T, with C, which is the first character, and so on. So this is how we perform the uh, shifted Hamming uh, distance. And how many of those, again, I need here? As I mentioned, we need, depends on the distance threshold. If it is two, then I'm having two sequences next to the, the original one, and another two that are shifted to the left, then compared using the Hamming distance. Now, another observation is that the exact matches between the sequences are like consecutive zeros represented in those factors. So you can see if in the same diagonal they are consecutive zeros, then this is um, an exact match between the two sequences. So my goal is to track those consecutive zeros among all those factors and count their length. So for example, the first one, one, two, three, four, five. So I have exact five matches. And the other one, I have another 5. So 5 and 5, I have 10 matches between the two sequences. So if I can do that in a very fast way, then I can infer something about the number of edits between the two sequences. You can process that using any hardware platform you like, or you have some good skills that FPGA, GPUs, SIMD could be processing in memory and so on. So now I'm going to explain Gatekeeper, which is the first FPGA-based pre-alignment folder. So this is um, accelerating the shifted Hamming distance. So we have the same observation. I'm going to go through it very fast. Now, you remember this diagonal coming from the dynamic programming table? I just laid them down um, horizontally. So the Hamming mask, or the first bit vector, is the one in the middle. And then one deletion mask means I'm shifting the query one step, then doing Hamming mask, Hamming distance calculation or XOR. And I'm doing the same thing for the two deletion mask, but I'm shifting it by two steps, then compare, and so on. Now, can anyone tell me what's the added descent threshold here? Excellent, perfect. How do you know that? Um, because there are several, seven preferences and this is two e plus one. Exactly, excellent. So we have the original one, which is the Hamming mask, plus two e um, other masks, right? And e here is three. Okay, so using this method, I can tolerate up to only three edits. So I can see. Um, and as I mentioned before, the goal is now how, to how you can track those green consecutive uh, zeros. Um, those segments, one, two, three, four. We have four segments. And the answer is within those segments. So if I could count the number of consecutive zeros here, then I can say something about the edit uh, distance between the two sequences. Shifted Hamming distance way is just to do AND operation to all vectors together. Now let's do the AND operation. What you get here, for example, you have vertically, because I am applying the AND operation vertically, so you can see some zeros and some ones. If you AND 0 to 1, then the 0 will dominate, right? Then the result will be 0. So I'm interested in finding this 1, because 1 represents an edit operation. If I'm canceling it using a 0, by ending it to 1, then there is no differences between them. Then I'm going to get false positive. False positive is OK, as long as the tool is fast. So one way to do that is said, OK, if you have just overall general view on the uh, content of those masks, you'll see a lot of short zeros. You can see here, single zero, 
couple of zeros, single zero, and so on. They are spreaded everywhere. And those will cause some problem when I do the AND operation. So let's get rid of those short zeros. So let's replace any single zero or any two zeros with ones. Why is that? Because if you observe the length of those green segments, they are always long. So this observation provides that those zeros, let's call them random, because I'm shifting in all direction, one step, two step, three step, then I'm going back, shift to the other direction, one step, two step, three steps, then comparing with that, that will provide me a lot of random zeros, it has no meaning. So let's cancel them and then apply again the AND operation. You can see here, for example, I'm canceling the zeros on the way of the ones, so the one will appear in the result of N. Of course, this is by luck. You may end up having not single zero here, so it cannot be replaced. You may have four zeros, for example, or five zeros. Why you pick one zero, two zeros? Why not three zeros? Why not four zeros? And so on. So again, all of those are heuristics. If they are providing results, it's fine. As long as you don't delete any correct mapping. Now if you apply the AND operation, you will see that one, two, three differences between the two sequences. Any question? Doesn't it introduce false negative? How is that? Like um, some get swapped, for example. Like uh, adjacent two bits get swapped, and if you shift right, one match, you shift uh, left in one match, and it should you should say the distance is of two, but here, yeah. That's excellent way of thinking. Yeah, that's true. This can produce a um, large number of false negative. How is that? Because I'm flipping the zero to one, and this is very dangerous. Why is that? Zero means match. If I'm flipping it to a mismatch, then I'm increasing the number of mismatches, right? It's a very good way of thinking. So you could have a single zero here, single zero here, zero here, here, and there. You could have it, right? You have no control over what you will have in a single column. So if you switch all of them, or if you amend all of them to ones, then you will have one in the end result. How we can do that? You do reverse to the step you did here. You, you apply the same thing here. So if you have three ones, you replace the one in the middle to a zero. Yeah. It works. Okay. So imagine you have this in the end result here, in this bit vector. So because I already, and here, yeah, for sure you have zeros, otherwise those will won't be three, right? So this have the probability of being zero before, and we amend it, and then the AND operation, we get it as one, right? So it, it might be this way before. So let's change it back to this way, and then recalculate the number of ones. And this will cancel all the false negative. You will never have false negative. And you do the same thing for four ones. If you have this, in any location here, then you need to convert this back to 0, 0. Then you count this as 2 rather than 4 once. Is this clear? Okay, excellent question. Why it worked now? Okay, and here I'm comparing the result I'm getting here with the result I'm, I can get with a perfect aligner. This is fully dynamic programming algorithm, Needleman Wunsch, that provide you the result that we have four edits, but my algorithm give me three edits rather than four. This is fine. Always underestimating the result is fine. But if you overestimate it, if you exceed the threshold, then it will be bad. Any question? Okay, excellent. So now this is more technical details about how you implement it in FPGA. So we choose a lookup table of size 5 input. Why is that? This is the way how you uh, amend those masks. So, okay, sorry. Before that, 
Generating the mask, I don't think it's challenging in FPGA. You just need to shift the bitwise, then you do XOR. And you will do for all of them in parallel, even in, at the mask level. So the mask itself, you can produce it in parallel. And over those masks, all of them, you can do it in parallel. Now, how you amend those zeros, single zero or uh, two zeros, you can use um, many of those working totally independent of each other, trying to have any five inputs, any five bits of each mask, and check whenever you have this pattern, so zero in the middle, this could be one or zero. If you have this pattern or one, zero, one, then you replace it directly, and each lookup table uh, can change only single bit. So how many lookup table basically you need? It's equal to the length of each mask. So if the mask is 100 and the output of each lookup table is only one bit, then you need this many of lookup tables. Why I need five input to the lookup table? This, I think it's very much clear to tell you why. So in this way, you can guarantee that you cover all the cases for 1001 or 101. Any question? Okay, this probably more technical details related to the way that the FPGA chip, which is this much, communicates with the input, which is uh, the reference genome and the read. And the output is going to another part, which could be in CPU again, or it could be in implemented in FPGA, which is the dynamic programming algorithm. And the beautiness of having this in FPGA is that you can have a large number of replications. And each one processing one sequence and one reference segment. So all of them can work in parallel. And within each replication, the mask can be processed in parallel. This is how you get the high amount of speed up. This is when we implement it inside the chip. This is the FPGA chip where you have um, the slices where you can implement the lookup tables and the way you communicate between those slices. Now this is the difference between Gatekeeper and SHD. If Gatekeeper is implemented on FPGA, SHD on SIMD instruction. This can be considered as multi-core because it has many replications, but SHD implemented on single core. Uh, this much can be processed at this rate of frequency, which is the maximum frequency can um, this FPGA can handle. So it basically it can work up to 200 megahertz, but when you add too many replication, then the critical path will be short for you. That's why the frequency is reduced a little bit. And apparently you need to transfer all those read and references from the host, which is the CPU, all the way to the FPGA, so you are limited or bounded by the, the um, memory bandwidth or the PCI Express data bandwidth or data transfer, which is basically this much of throughput. But here you are, you are not limited basically to the, the throughput of the... You are limited by the SIMD instruction register that you are using to hold the, the value when you do the SIMD operation or the SIMD instruction. So in this version, this implementation of SSD, they are limited to 128 base pair. So you can, um, so the, the register size basically is 250, right? Because each character is encoded as two bits because we have A, C, G, T, so to represent four characters, you need two bits encoding, right? So this implementation is limited to 250. If we have a newer version, which we have actually, can implement up to 512 and so on, but still limited with the read length. Anyway, this number of resources needed, it's not that much interesting, and the best Part is the amount of speed up you gain. So if you remember, SSD was providing 3x of speed up, but here we provide 130x of speed up. Why is that? Because we have parallelism at the mask level and at the sequences level. We have lower false accept rate, and this provides end-to-end speed up when you combine this filter with a dynamic programming algorithm plus hash table. Now this is the conclusion of Gatekeeper. So FPGA based um, method can provide uh, great speed up. And 
as I mentioned before, the news from the last year when Alumina acquired that company producing FPGA chips, then think about this if it can combine with the solution they have in hand. So if they have the machine that produce or which is basically a sequencer that can have analysis inside it in the FPGA board, then you can transfer your uh, bit file to that FPGA board and update the analysis that they are doing. Then you can accelerate the sequencer itself more. And this enables real-time filtering while sequencing, as I mentioned before. You don't have to wait 44 hours to get a bunch of reads, then you start analyzing them. This is the paper. Again, the good thing that we are doing in our group is all the software that we have are open source. Everything are uploaded to um, GitHub. You can have it. Even the FPGA architecture, Vivado project, you can have it. Uh, um, download it, synthesize it, change it, and do whatever you want with it. Okay, can we improve the accuracy? So again, doing end operation between those masks apparently has some issues, right? Even if we change the single zero or two zeros, there is no guarantee that will provide you a perfect accuracy. Why is that? There is no guarantee that selecting single zero, or two zero, or three zero, or four zero will provide a good um, accuracy because there is no theory behind it, right? Just by luck or heuristic. Now let's try something different. So the key observation in this work, which is magnet, so we observe that those green segments spread it over the mask, if you still remember them, we have four segments, they are always long and non-overlapping, meaning that I don't have to end, end them with all the masks, so I can go to that green segment, count the length of it, it is the longest locally or within that window, then I'm good enough, good enough to know just the length of that green segment. And I'm going to show a method now how we can do that in FPGA. So the key idea just count the consecutive zeros. Count the length of those segments. Don't do an operation. We don't need and operation because apparently providing high uh, number of false positive. So by doing this magnet is up to 400x faster than its CPU implementation using FPGA and we can have two or eight replications because it's very expensive the computation done by magnet and we have um, yeah we have this much of accuracy 25,000 x more accurate than gatekeeper because apparently we go to the solution and we pick it rather than we end it with all the false or random zeros now this is challenging to be implemented in FPJ. Why is that? Okay, again, we have the same example or a little bit different. So we have one, two, three, four, five. We have five now green segments. What's the added distance threshold here is four because we have five masks shifted to the right and another, sorry, we have four shifted to the right and another four shifted to the left. So don't do add operation, don't amend those short zeros, rather than going mask by mask and start counting what's the largest number of consecutive zeros you have it over a mask. So when you do linear scan over all mask, you will get this as a solution, which is the one with the largest number of consecutive zeros. And that's why we have number one in the yellow circle over there. So then you amend all the numbers within this window into one. Now reiterate again. Count over all masks again. So, okay, because, because I found this segment of zeros in the middle, so for sure there was something after it and before it there was some edits or modification after it and before it. Why is that? If I don't have any modifications, then I will get full mask of zeros, right? All of it zeros. But because I get short segment, meaning that there was something happening before and after. So to do correct operation, I'm going to add that one myself. So I change now all the content of the mask within that window into ones. Then I will add one to the, uh, to the left and one to the right. Now repeating the same steps again and again in divide and conquer approach, meaning that this is a sub-problem totally independent of this sub-problem and solve them in parallel. 
so count the number of zeros in each mask you will find this vector is the largest so cancel everything within this window the window size equal to the length of that green segment and then add one to the right one to the left repeat all of this and keep creating some problems smaller size until you finish the entire thing now how many times you add the ones to the right and left this is your number of edits which is basically the yellow uh, rectangle the vertical lines how many of them we have four so this is your number of edits then you can record it here in this vector and you count it or you save it somewhere in the register this is how you implement an FPJ you have basically a counter that counts the entire content of each mask so how many of you those counters you need the number of masks so which is related to 2e plus 1 so each counter the number of bits is equivalent to uh, um, logarithmic of the length of that mask now this is how we implemented an FPGA board you can see a large number of replications and again the source code is available online now apparently processing the entire mask is very inefficient why is that? what if I have longer read length then I need to change totally the entire design why is that? because the counter cannot handle more than this much of number of bits right? so if I increase the length of the mask then I need to increase that and imagine that, uh, that I'm all the time counting the entire content of the mask from f very first bit all the way to the last bit every time I'm doing that and whenever you find this much of consecutive zeros then again I'm, I'm going to change all the content of zeros to ones why I'm changing that? why I'm flipping all zeros to ones? because when I iterate again over the mask I don't count them again so I cancel the segment that I already discovered before that's why I, count, I convert them to ones so apparently this is very inefficient so the previous work was archived and this one is published which is including both work so Shuji, we call it Shuji I'm going to explain the meaning of the name later on and that one was Magnet so here what we said, okay we agreed with Magnet that the solution is within those green segments that they are long and non-overlapping we want to collect them basically we don't want to do any end operation we, we want to go to them, to these green segments and count their length so the key idea, okay, let's use a fixed size of sliding window we don't want to relate the window size or the sliding window that we use to search to the length of the segment no, make it fixed length you want 7, you want 4, 5, that's it and this is your problem, count how, what's the longest um, green segment of consecutive zeros and this will be your answer so this method we provide 160x of speed up faster than CPU implementation and um, we combine it with idlib idlib is a perfect read aligner that's 100% accurate but it's slow again because it's dynamic programming so combining Shuji with idlib or Perazil which is another one uh, provide 18.8x of speed up now this is the accuracy result it's 400x more accurate than gatekeeper apparently is um, less, less accuracy than magnet why is that? because I'm having a fixed size window when I slide it and search so rather than having the entire length of the green segment I'm having part of it counted and another part in another window so if I, my window happened to be located in the middle of overlap of two segments then I'm going to count it wrongly let's see if this works again okay perfect so imagine I have this green segment and this green segment then my window happened to be here then counting where's the largest number of consecutive zeros I'm not going to get this and then this because I'm always having, I need one solution so if this is another mask here this is mask here 
So I'm going to count, okay, I have five here, maybe, here another three, so five is the largest, so I'm having here five. Then I'm going to add one here. But in fact, this one overlapped with that, so I'm having extra one here. How to solve that? Do a lot of overlapping sliding windows. So if you have a sliding window here, do another one, slide it by single chef, another one here. By overlapping, so you are guaranteeing the next round, your sliding window will start from here, because you shifted every time by one step. So you start counting from here all the way forward. So this is how you can collect the correct number of consecutive zeros. Now let's see a toy example here. Okay, so we all know how to build this thing. We, we are not using dynamic programming here anymore, just bit, uh, bitwise uh, operations, uh, vectors of zeros and ones. And our goal is to collect those yellow things. You could lay it um, down horizontally to think about it in a correct way. Now this is the first sliding window. We select the size here to be four. Maybe I'm going to explain next slide why four. So now give me the largest number of consecutive zeros diagonally. So going this way and count the number of zeros. Let's do it all together. So here we have single zero, sorry. And the next diagonal, single zero, single zero, then four zeros, single zero, two zeros, single zero. This is the largest number of zeros. You could have ties, meaning that you could have two segments of the same length. So what's the largest is four. Then record it somewhere. We call it Shuji bit vector. And then slide the search window by one step ahead. Repeat the same steps. So we have single zero, single zero, single zero, then three zeros, then single zero, two zeros, and no zeros. Then record this number here. Now when you, because they are overlapped, so you'll get overlapped results as well. So which one to store in this Shuji bit vector? Apparently this sliding window and the first one was overlapped by three bits, right? Because we always shifted by one step. So which one provide you least number of ones? Pick that answer. Whenever you have largest number of zeros, pick that one. Why we select this choice? Just to underestimate number of ones. We always pick the largest number of zeros. And this way, we don't have false negative. It's okay to have false positive. Again, false positive means something we don't want it, but we have it. That's fine. But if something that we wanted, and we discard it, this is bad. So we keep doing this, keep sliding the search window by one step, and recording the value in true bit vector, and then we get the result, which is three ones, so we have three edits in this um, question, or in this problem. So now, what's um, the good thing in this design? That is scalable. We don't care about the read length here, the mask length. It's always fixed for a bit wide. So we can have, and all of them are independent of each other. There is no calculation transferred from one sliding window to another. So all of them are working in, in parallel. So you can have all of those sliding window doing the search process over all the mask um, in parallel. And how many of those do we need? Exactly the same length of Shuji bit vector or any length of the sequences because all of them uh, shifted by one step. So every character we have one search window. Why we call it Shuji? Is Seramichi here? No. Okay, so this is door in Japan, they call it Shuji and they slide it. So that's why we call it Shuji because we have this sliding window, we are sliding over the masks. Anyone from Japan here? Yeah, here. Oh yeah, Saramichi is there. Yeah. So Saramichi corrected me. He told me Shuji is not the door, is the decoration we stick it to the door. <laughs> but it was too late. Uh huh. Okay, <laughs> that's a good sign because we already published the paper. There's no chance to change the name. Okay, why we pick the size of the window to be 4? So we try many configuration. 
with size of one, of course, it will be very bad to collect all single zeros because there can be random zeros as well. Uh, why not five? After four, we notice that we start producing false negative, which is bad. We don't want it. And there's theory behind it, basically. So what's the smallest match that you can get? Single zero, right? But we don't want to have a window of size one. So we have a single zero. This is the smallest match. And because it's the smallest, so it should be one and one here. Otherwise, it won't be the smallest, right? If, there's, if there are no ones here, then it should be something like this. So this will be the smallest. OK. Yeah. And to reduce the number of false positive, we increase the size by 1. Why is that? Because if there is a 1 here, then this is a 1. If there is another 0, then it's going to overlap with the next window size. So the best size to have this window is 4, is what we notice. And by this way, we are covering even the smallest match within a window. So we can capture it anyway. And with the help of overlapping windows, we can cover the, any length, any, any um, uh, length of those segments of consecutive zeros, even the one that overlapped in the middle, as I explained that example. OK, so this is a perfect to be implemented on FPGA. Why is that? Because each search window is basically a lookup table. You can look up the number, uh, the, the content of the vector, and have the length pre-computed before. So what are the... So what are the permutation of having a 4-bit wide vector of zeros and ones? Is this much? So we record the number of zeros in each one of them, and then we, look it, we locked it up, basically. This is how we do it in a very fast way. We don't need to do any clock, any clocking. We don't need to wait for certain clock cycles to compute the results. And we have as many as we want of those lookup table, counting all those uh, zeros in each mask. And this way, we can achieve a very fast computation, independent of the length of the read or the mask and so forth. The good thing, if your lookup table requires four input, then it's good to pick FPJ that has a lookup table with four input. So currently, the most recent one has seven input. So it's not a problem for you. But it's not good to go with the one having like two input lookup tables. Then you will consume more lookup tables, more complex design. Again, this one is available online, the C implementation as well as the FPJ implementation. With the toy data, you can play with it, you can run it at your machine. So if you have another ideas where you can count at a distance in a very fast way, it's okay again to have false positive, that's fine. It's not a bad idea. So if you have another idea other than using AND, maybe XOR, maybe NAND, something like that, Think about it, re-implement it yourself and see if it works fine, no false positive, then implement it in FPJ and have something good for everyone. Medicine, hospital, sequencing our genomes, analyzing it. Okay, so now let's move to a slightly different uh, pre-alignment filter that we, we noticed that all those data, the computation is very simple. We agree, all of us, that we just do end operation or some lookup, kind of lookup table. But the amount of data that we are moving from the CPU or the host to the FPGA is huge. So this one limiting us from doing more replications in the FPGA design. So the, the, you can see that uh, the same observation is noticeable in Shuji, Gatekeeper, Magnet, SHD as well. It's limited by the, the, regist the SIMD registers and so forth. So the solution, let's try processing in memory, which is a new computing paradigm. It's not that new. The idea was there before. We agree. But now the trends start moving toward this direction because we start in having some commercial devices that we can use for this idea. 
Okay, now our goal is change slightly little bit. Let's design mapping and filtering algorithm inside the memory where we don't need to move the data from the host to the CPU or to the FPGA to process it. So whenever the data resides there, let's compute it there. Let's process it in the same place. And this is basically the main idea behind the next work, which we call it the Grim Filter. And the main driver for this work is Jeremy, sitting in the back. He's the lead for this project. And I'm going to explain the algorithm basically first, then the way they implement it inside HMC Cube or any 3D stacked memory. Okay, so they have the genome. Now, they don't have the hash table. What they want to do is they have this genome, they want to slice it or shear it into very small segments and process each segment as a bin. What does a bin mean? Just like segment of character, now they convert into bit vector. How they convert into bit vector? So they said, okay, we want the seed length to be five, for example. Okay, five, maybe? Yeah, it's five. So we pick we enumerate all kind of uh, all kind of seeds that are of length five. So we start from A, 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 then change one character, then another character, and so forth until we enumerate all possible values of uh, seed of length five. And then we check the bin we selected. Whenever we have this seed, we record 1. If we don't have this seed, we record 0. If we have AAT, which is somewhere in the middle, then we record 1, and so forth. And this will be the representative of this bin. Is it clear? So we represent each bin as a bit vector. So it's, it's kind of similar to the hash table, right? Because we are hashing the seeds and whenever it exists, we sort, we record the location list of that seed. Here, exactly the same thing. We record that exists or does not exist. So we are doing this for all bins. And because those are very short, we don't want to miss any of them. Imagine this, for example, happening uh, part of it in this bin and the other part in the another bin, so we don't want to cut those seeds into smaller pieces. So that's why we have overlapped bins. So we can overlap them, then we don't lose sensitivity, so we can capture all kinds of seeds in that bin. We do this for the entire genome or the entire sequence you have in hand, and then now you will get the read. Yeah. Exactly. So if your seed length is 5, it's better to overlap it by 5, but you could go for more and test it whether to provide false positive or not, false negative or not, and so forth. It's not like more overlap because anyways I'm getting information under the bin. I see. So what was the amount of overlapping between the bins? Is it half of the bin or...? Uh, no size of the seed, the read. Okay, it was the size of the read. Why not the seed? Okay. So apparently we don't want to lose the sensitivity for a single seed. So it can be a seed is good enough to have overlapped of this much of amount of overlap, but to have the read as well, you will cover the, 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 the worst case, the amount of overlap between two bins. To have like 100 or 1,000 between two bins overlapped, then you are, can covering more and more between them. So whenever you have this case, the one I explain here, you can cover it anyhow. If, the, if they are overlapping here, then your search window somewhere will start here at one of the bends. Again, as I mentioned, all of those are heuristics. 
the, the goal behind it is not to provide 100% accuracy or zero false positive. It's okay to have false positive, but the nice thing is uh, how you can reduce this false positive as much as possible. And keep it very fast. So this is the goal. Don't increase the computation here. Okay, so this is how we generate the bin. We do the same thing for the read sequence. So now we build the index data structure using bins. And this is how we build it out of the read. Now we can query it very fast. So if it exists here, we build this bit vector. And then, now we have the bit vector from the bin and the bit vector from the other bin and so forth. So we store basically those bit vectors somewhere in the memory. And now we have this read again. We generate the bit vector out of it. And this will be a representative of the read. We have already the representative of the genome. Then it's very easy to compare them together. What are the number of ones that exist in both bit vector? This is basically the matches between the two uh, segments. So you add them up. More than threshold discarded, less than threshold or equal. Keep it. Now you could get the hash table from the host, from the CPU. You send the location to the gram filter, then gram filter get one read sequence, compare it with those, generate bit factor in case you don't want to generate the bands for the entire genome. So you can get just the location where that bin exists and then compare with that only inside the memory. Do it a distance calculation. Again, it could be inside memory if you could implement it there or you could have it in the CPU side. But the goal behind all those kind of work is to reduce the data movement, right? So we don't want to send back anything to the CPU. But still okay to do it if you notice that we are already reducing the amount of workload. So you could, rather than sending 10 million pair of sequences, you can send just a few hundreds of them or thousands of them to the CPU. This is fine. But it will be great to have everything in one place. Now the, 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 the key idea behind this Grim filter or the nice thing about it is just using simple operation just like where you count with a, or you match or sorry you compare the seed whether it exists or not you record one and then you add all those ones together and you have the result ready, right? So it's highly parallel, why is that? Because you can compare with all bands right away because you have many bit vectors and, and this is what the memory provides you, very high throughput so you can transfer this much of data, do simple operation over all of them or each of them and you will have the result ready. This is memory bound, why is that? Because you are limited by the, the, uh, the throughput you have and uh, the frequent access to large bit vectors. So the best way to implement it is 3D stacked memory. What is 3D stacked memory? I'm sure all of you are aware about it, right? How many of you know 3D stacked memory? Just a few? Okay. Anyway, 3D stacked memory, you can think about it as many layers of DRAM chip. So each one is totally uh, separated DRAM chip. And they are stacked on top of each other. They are connected with TCA. TSVs, those are very high bandwidth links between the DRAM chips. You can move data uh, backward and forward, back and forth between the chip. And the good thing that you have a logic layer, single layer, so you have many layers of memory, but single layer of logic layer. What you can do in this logic layer? You can implement any kind of operation you like. So you can think about it as FPGA chip where you can implement a lookup table. So you can have your own cores where you can process data without moving it from this memory cube to the CPU, for example. So if your algorithm is simple enough, this will be a very good uh, fit for your uh, algorithm. So in, in, in the Gram filter, 
what they do with again the DRAM chip as any DRAM um, DIM has like the, the single DRAM chip has an array of banks in each bank you can have the data um, organized as rows and you can access the entire row once meaning that you cannot access at bit level you just need to access the entire row bring it to the row buffer and then process it for example in the logic layer So you can see the bit vector is um, equivalent to the number of enumerations that you can have from one seed. So if your seed length is 10, then you have a huge list of enumerations, right? So it's not related to the read length or the bin size. It's related to how, uh, what are the number of enumerations that you can have for a certain seed. So the best setup that Jeremy maybe think of it is to have those bit vector organized in a vertical layout organized with the DRAM. So meaning that the first bit of the bit factor is stored in one of the rows and the second bit is stored in the next rows and so on. So you can access them bit by bit going one by one. And this is actually good because you will check them one by one and count how many ones you have and then add them up, right? If you still remember the algorithm. And here in the logic layer, what they implemented is the comparator because they need to compare uh, two bit vectors together to see whether they, there was a match here or there was a one here and there was a one here. Then this is a perfect match, then add it up or accumulate the result together. So you have a counter and you have a comparator. So this is a low area overhead, so it can perfectly uh, fit into the, the logic layer. And if it is simple enough, again, you can have many replication of those. But if you are doing complex operation, then you might not get huge benefits from 3D stacked memory because you cannot have much of replication in the logic layer. If you have only three replications, then even if you have a huge amount of memory because you have too many DRAM chips with high bandwidth communication between them, then you cannot process them. So you will end up having the same problem. So make sure you have very simple design in the logic layer. So this is the way they test it with real data. And they measure false performance and false negative rate. Here the false negative rate means the false positive rate. So we want um, as less as we can of false positive rate and it's better to have it zero percent but we cannot do that because this is not our goal right our goal is to speed up the alignment process not the the, the accuracy of it so the, the, the amount of speed up the they have is 1.8 to 3.7x of speed up compared to the fast hash do you remember fast hash which is seed filter using the cheap kamers and the adjacency filtering. So you can see the, the execution time varies between the data because some of the data require uh, to go over the entire bit vector. Some of them already exceed the threshold within the first few parts of the vector, so you don't need to process it entirely. You can flush it away. This is the false positive rate. Again, we want it to be reduced. They call it in the paper false negative rate, but it depends on the way you are looking at this problem. So if you are at the input size, at the input side, then you call it false, ne uh, false positive. If you are the output side, then you call it false negative. So you can read more about it in this paper, it's already published, BMC Genomics, last year. And the source code is available, you can play with it as well. This is what we follow in our research group. Okay, so what's the future for genome analysis? So we know that now we have two types of sequencers. One of them produce very short reads, but um, almost accurate and the other type is very long but 15% of sequencing errors. So I believe if this nanopore or back pile like getting improved over the time and again one important parameter is the cost. So it's not the accuracy, it's not the read length. The cost is very important. If it's three billion dollar per genome then nobody will afford it. 
it's useless. So we want all of those parameters to get improved. So this uh, sequencing technology introduced in May 2014 and mm, this number improved to 2 million characters currently. One of the papers reported that. But unfortunately we have high error rates. And this is how it looks like for one of the devices. Again, if it is very small, it will be very cheap. This one about a few hundreds dollar. But because it's size is very small, then it's very high uh, error rate. Providing this. And one way to solve this issue with the higher error rate, so John Fertina, for example, is focusing on correcting those reads. If they have high error rate, he develops some method to correct those reads at the read level or at after constructing the genome. So you have two methods to do that. Yes, let's have the clean board. Okay. So we agreed first that we always use high coverage from the sequencing machine, which is, for example, 30x. So this is your reference. This is the reads that are generated by the sequencer. And because we have 30x of speed up, uh, sorry, 30x of coverage, then we can cover the same location 30 times, for example. And because we already have many of those overlapped reads, even if, they ha if, even if they are inaccurate, having a lot of sequencing errors, but because of the, they are overlapped and we have 30 of those reads, so we said, okay, how many of those reads at this location having A, for example? If the majority of them are A, then we consider this location as A in this read, or this read, or that one. In this way, this is one of the ways, of course. There are other methods how to correct the reads. This is one we call it majority voting. So if those overlapped reads having many of them A's, less T's, so probably this is a sequencing error. So let's convert it into A's. So the other way to correct those reads is to, to overlap them, build the assembly, then align the read to the read themselves or use short and long reads so you have the long reads overlap all of them and map the short to the long reads and build the assembly out to fit and then try to correct them using some machine learning or graph based algorithm to correct those so this is John Fertina probably maybe he will present about it or you can have his paper Apollo, it's already in archive, this is the most recent one, or Hercules. So this is to correct the reads themselves, this is to correct the assembly after you build it. Assembly mean when you connect those reads together, when you already solve the read mapping uh, problem, or when you don't have the reference, you do de novo assembly as we saw in the bacteria graph. So when we have a new technology, this, of course, we develop the algorithm after the technology exists, after the sequencing technology, right? So if they are changing the, the sequencer itself, probably we need to change the algorithms uh, after that, which analyze the output of those uh, sequencing machine. So if we have more accurate reads, then probably we don't need to correct them. If we have more longer reads, then probably we don't need to do read alignment. But the, the problem, for example, of metagenomics, where we compare many genomes together, still exists, right? Even uh, with improved sequencer machines, that won't solve the problem. Because again, how to compare 60,000 genomes with one genome, even if you can build it up entirely from the sequencing machine? So this is another uh, computer science challenging problem to solve. So you can see, for example, here the polishing step and read-to-read -read overlap finding is the one I was talking about here and how to correct the reads themselves coming from long reads. So those two steps get introduced just because of the sequencing technology that's producing inaccurate reads, right? You can read more about the long read sequencing technology. This is another paper from our group. Describing all those challenges, the, the future of those sequencing technology, 
what are the needs, the demand for those technologies, how to analyze them, what was changed from short to long reads and going forward. So, any questions so far? Okay, great. So, what we covered today, the importance of genome analysis, what is genome analysis basically, how to perform read mapping, and what makes um, read mapper slow, and um, a way or observation to accelerate the read mapping process, and providing some algorithms, some hardware accelerations, or architecture to accelerate this read mapping process. And we talk a little bit about long read sequencing technology. You can um, read more about the papers we have in our group. And we will be very happy, basically, to have some of you, all of you interested in doing research with our group as an intern, master's student, PhD student, doing some projects, even short time project with our group in different field, genomics or computer architecture in general. So, as a conclusion for today's talk, system design for bioinformatics is a critical problem. It's life critical, I would say. It has large scientific and personal implications as well. And here we explain about key steps in bioinformatics called genome sequence analysis. Of course, there are many steps in, um, in genome analysis. And there are many more in bioinformatics in general. So there are many bottlenecks exist in accessing and manipulating a huge amount of genomic data during analysis, and we use some heuristics that provide some false positive, that's true, but they are very fast to process this huge amount of data. Think about it if you want to analyze like the entire population of Switzerland, for example. It will be very beneficial in these cases. And we cover various real recent research problem to accelerate read mapping. And this journey started in September uh, 2006. Me, myself, I started 2014 during my PhD and I'm continuing working on it after uh, already having my PhD. Now doing, um, continuing this research on this area as well as other areas like metagenomics, graph processing, using all the hardware technology we have in hand, like processing in memory, FPGA, GPU, SIMD, and so forth. So you can check the, 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 the research interest we have on uh, Professor Honor Mutlu Research Group. You can check the recent paper and check if you are interested in some of them. And you can send us email anytime. Of course, all of this uh, research effort that I presented, I would like to acknowledge Honor Mutlu, Jana Lakan was my PhD advisor. They are, were great mentors to me, my colleague, most of them exist here, Jeremy, John, Saramichi, Ivan, uh, we have Richard and Nito. <laughs> and of course, the funding agencies did a great job funding all this research effort. All right, any question? Okay, thank you so much. See you tomorrow.